Here we have the confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. May we greet one another. You, believer, are truly free. With that, the title for today is Witness of the Gospel. Starting this Sunday, we are looking at the words of one of the four Gospels, the Gospel of Mark. We have been looking at the words of Acts for the past eight months. In fact, the amazing history of field change in the Acts of the Apostles begins with the Gospel. So Luke, the author of Acts, begins his book with in the first book. That's how he starts the book. And what is that? It is Luke. The book of Acts records the history of realistically showing the core of the gospel through the gospel of Luke and using the gospel as a platform to change the field. That's why the word of the gospel is so important. As the name suggests, this book was written by Mark. Mark made a brief appearance when we look at the words of Acts. Before Matthew, Mark was written before in the events. In the background of Acts chapter 1 and 2, Mark's upper room appears, and this Mark is the same person. This is the background. Mark was a person who accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missions trip, but returned to Jerusalem midway through. So in other words, it means that prayer started in Mark's house. And he left midway through because it was so difficult. He went back to Jerusalem. This eventually led Paul and Barnabas to take different paths in the ministry because of Mark. During the second missions trip, Paul did not want to take Mark, whereas Barnabas wanted to take Mark. So they were having a dispute, and they split because of this. However, later, Paul restored his relationship with Mark. In 2 Timothy 4.11, when Paul was in Rome, in the prison, he told Timothy to bring Mark with him. And Paul confessed that Mark was beneficial to his work and that he received great comfort and strength from Mark. What does that mean? That is how much Mark lived a changed life af after that. After Paul's martyrdom, Mark worked with Peter as an interpreter when Paul testified the gospel in Rome. So with Peter, they were preaching the gospel. So they were doing this ministry together. First Peter 5.13, you can see that Peter grew up to be a trusted disciple to the point where he called Mark his son of faith. That's how much growth he had. In short, Mark worked together with two spiritual giants of the early church and received the most accurate information and spiritual interpretation about Jesus. He heard about the life of Jesus realistically from Peter and realistically heard of the spiritual interpretation 
of Jesus's various ministries, and the Christ-centered interpretation of the Old Testament from Paul. So Mark, who had this kind of background of ministry, was faced with extreme persecution by the believers of Rome. The reason why he wrote the Gospel of Mark was to give them true hope by conveying to them the Gospel of Jesus Christ that he had heard while ministering with Paul and Peter. Before we explore into the message of the Gospel of Mark, we must see the reassuring faith that the author of Mark had demonstrated. It is not about wallowing in the past mistakes, but about dusting ourselves off and having a fresh start. Yes, he betrayed and ran away. Yes, he made a mistake, but he did not reside there, and he did not fail. He brushed it off and started anew with a new heart. This is the image of the one who has the gospel. Because you made one mistake, you should not fall into judgments or trials. You should not live like that. You should stand again. Winston Churchill, a renowned British leader, left us with a meaningful saying. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. The courage. That is success. That is right. The courage to start anew. The courage to persist and to keep challenging on is what matters. In the name of the Lord, starting from today through the words of the Gospel of Mark, I pray that all believers of Yohan Church will stand as the witnesses of the Gospel beyond our current situations, circumstances, and appearances. Number one, the start of the Gospel, Jesus Christ. Verse one. The Gospel of Mark opens with the proclamation about the beginning of the gospel. Just as Genesis 1-1 declares the beginning of creation, Mark 1-1 is an announcement of the beginning of the gospel. From a creative perspective, it signifies the declaration of a new creation. Recreation. It is a great thing. Everything was twisted and distorted because of the events in Genesis chapter 3. But the way to return to the original state of creation is found in this gospel. The only way is the gospel. What Mark is revealing was at the beginning of the gospel is the fact that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the true answer. He defines the gospel very concisely, keeping in mind the confession of fa faith found in Mark 16.16 16, where Peter, who was Mark's spiritual father, confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This gospel in Greek is referred to as Evangelion. In Roman times, this word was used to proclaim news of victory in war or other significant news from the Roman Empire as it was a period of many wars. However, Mark declares that Jesus is the greatest news in human history. The Roman Empire Emperor does not offer true hope. The only hope we have on this earth is in Jesus Christ. 
we often think of the gospel as something intended for unbelievers. Currently, it is crucial that the gospel needs to be relayed to the non-believers, but we must never overlook the fact that the existing believers need to explore deeper into the gospel. We need to establish the strong partisan of God within us. The believers must know that what is important is this gospel, going deeper into the gospel, establishing the strong partisan of God within us. Mark did not write this gospel for the unbelievers of Rome. The purpose that he wrote the book of Mark was not for the unbelievers. He wrote it to the believers who had already had faith to fulfill them with the courage and hope enabling them to stand boldly as Christ's true disciples, transcending all trials and persecutions. When Mark mentions the start of the gospel with Jesus Christ, he just doesn't mention it, saying Jesus Christ. He identifies Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Dear Jesus Christ as the Son of God has begun a new era on this earth. So what does it mean to say the Son of God about Jesus? The Son of God. What is the meaning behind this? Does it mean that a father and son relationship is established when a parent gives birth to a child, just like we do? No, it doesn't mean that. God did not get married, and it's not that Jesus was born. It is not in that stance. When we say son, we use it to give birth to or to create. However, the Bible sometimes uses the word son to mean equal on the same level. In other words, to say that Jesus is the son of God means that he is an equal being to God. This is why it is a triune God. So what is the difference between the Muslims and us? They worship Allah. They don't use the word God. It's just Allah. In their Bible, it says Allah. But there is just one difference. It's the triune God. That is why Philippians 2 6 reads, Who, through he was in form of God, it's the same person as God, the same being. Jesus is the same as God, specifically the phrase, the Son of God emphasizes the kingship of Jesus Christ. He is the one who has the rulership of God. The Gospel of Mark emphasizes the kingship of Jesus Christ among the powers of prophet, priest, and king. Jesus Christ is the king of kings with the different powers on this earth, opening a new age of the Gospel. When we proclaim the gospel with the kingship of Jesus Christ, spiritual works takes place. With this kingship, if you have this and proclaim the gospel in the field, you have this kingship in the field. There will be the paradigm shift. You have to go out with the kingship of Christ. And of the prophet, priest, and king, you have to have this kingship. Without the kingship of 
Christ, how can you preach the gospel, do evangelism and missions? It's just walking around eggshells. You have this kingship. Satan says that you don't have the sin, deceives you, but the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ, you are the Christians who have this. Only that way you'll be able to make the paradigm shift and there will be arrivals in your ministries and departments. And there will be an expansion and growth in evangelization. What power do you have to evangelize? Going overseas to do missions, you go out with the kingship. With the kingship that Christ has given you, darkness will be broken down and the kingdom of God will reign. There's a question from Pastor A.W. Tozer's books asking, is it worship or a show? Many churches have watered down the truth of Christianity so that if it were poison, no one would be killed by it. And if it was medicine, it would be so diluted that it would heal no one. It has been diluted to that state, not being able to save or kill, not being able to heal or fix. These are very significant words. A church that is lost, a church that is like a church has been lost. The church has lost its essence. We need to break through this lethargic normalcy. We must fully proclaim the absolute gospel of unity. That is why we're carrying out the team of three and the team of three movements. Even if you were appointed as a church officer, they don't feel anything. It's like water in water and alcohol in alcohol. And this is what a W. Tozer pastor is saying. This is the state of the church. Being lethargic is normal. Having power, passion, devotion in evangelization and prayer, it is not normal now. Why? Why are you trying to stand out? It hasn't been long since you came to church. Why are you so loud? When one is trying to have some devotion, people ask, why are you showing off? How much money do you have? Churches are like that. Even upper room churches are like that. Do you understand? I'm hearing it. They cannot have devotion according to what they want. In other words, it's that the churches are closing down. Their doors are closing. If there is a festival, they don't want to hear it. Wanting to do something new, they say no. They curse at it. They're very pessimistic about it. That's what happened. And the church has no power. Upon those who has this unique gospel, this is the only way to live. Aren't all religions the same? That's what the WCC says. All religion is the same. God is not like that where God only allows the Christians to go to heaven. what people don't want to hear and who thinks that it's such a burden it's the team of three and the three movements do you understand what satan hates the most the team of three what satan is mad about two three seven five thousand people groups 
examine yourself, your spiritual state. How do you react? Don't question why you are not blessed by God. Yesterday, the Yanwan Chinese Regional Church was established in the region of Terim, Yongdeungpo. Through the dedication of the multi-ethnic committee and Chinese ministers, an absolute watchtower for evangelization of China has been established in the region of Terim. A hundred percent. It's uh, made out of Chinese people. In that region, 90% of people are Chinese. Think about it. The people in China, it's all about the dragon culture and they worshipped idols. They never went to church. They were in a country of communi communism. But shining the light there, we have established the watchtower, the Bartizan. And starting tomorrow, the overseas evangelism camp will be held in Japan, which can be said to be the birthplace of the dark culture. You have to follow up and catch up. As I mentioned in detail during Friday's prayer meeting, there will be a busking camp, an appointment ceremony for the church officers, and an establishment service for the Christian Funeral Service Center, Cultural Center. Please intensively pray that the members of the Hamamatsu Yanwan Church and the 60 camp team members will be able to use their spiritual authority of Jesus Christ to build the absolute watchtower of Christ. In China, in Japan, it is the culture where if there is the funeral, they go to the center for Catholicism or for Buddhism, that's the culture there. But the missionary did not want to, their believers to be for the funeral to be done that way, so they bought a center. May you be able to use your authority. I bless you in the name of the Lord that all you want church communities may be able to become the 237 missionary community that possesses all the nations. Number two, the first witness, John the Baptist, Mark 1, 2 to 5. After Mark proclaimed the beginning of the gospel, stating that it is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he mentions John the Baptist, who can be considered the first witness of the gospel. John the Baptist gained the role of announcing the fact that the Messiah, the Christ, had come, which people of Israel had been eagerly anticipating and longing for under the time of oppression from the Romans. What is particularly important is that the life of John the Baptist was not a mere coincidence. It had already been prophesied in the Old Testament books of Malachi and Isaiah. Listen carefully, it has been prophesied in advance. 
what had been prophesied in the Old Testament has been fulfilled in the New Testament. Verse 2 refers to Malachi 31, and verse 3 refers to the prophecy from Isaiah 43, indicating that these prophecies were made in advance and that the one prophesied was John the Baptist himself. One of the important features of the Bible is that it prophesies in advance and demonstrates the fulfillment of those promises. Therefore, holding on to the word is essential. The word of the pulpit. If not, there is no reason to come to church because the word will be inevitably fulfilled. And the response to the fulfillment of the covenant occurs in the life of the one who holds on to the word. Amen. If you hold on to the covenant, you'll be able to follow the word. If there is no word, it is a lie. Those who don't have the word, they have no fulfillment. Because they've never held on to the word and prayed, so they don't know if things are fulfilled or not. So that is religion. That is religion within Christianity. So even if they went to church for decades, there is nothing to say because they did not experience it. So evangelization missions has nothing to do with them. They just know it from the outer appearance. Those who hold on to the word will be able to see the fulfillment of the word of the covenant. Today's passage makes it clear that the core of the prophecy regarding John the Baptist was his role in preparing for the way of the coming of the Lord. You have to hold on to the word, but for most people, they forget about it. You watch a movie or a drama, and people tear, and they're able to talk about what the story was about, and look. F then they look forward to the next episode. But it's not like that for worship. But that's the heart of thorns, of stones, of the path. So they don't have that. Only the good soil will be able to bear fruits. Embracing the pulpit message into your heart, holding on to the word, and then you'll be able to bear fruits. So the core of John the Baptist was preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist removed obstacles and made the path straight for John Jesus to undertake his public ministry so he would be able to carry on his ministry in peace. During the time of the John the Baptist, there had been great spiritual darkness for about 400 years since the last prophet, Prophet Malachi. For 400 years, it was complete darkness where there was no word that was heard from God, as God did not speak. In other words, John had the responsibility of awakening the people of Israel who had fallen into spiritual indifference. For 400 years, they were in the state. So they were worshiping idols, being in the spiritual indifference. And then John the Baptist appeared and was preaching the gospel, so it was very difficult for him. Mark 1, 78. John the Baptist was the first witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He proclaimed two main messages. First, he called for repentance, proclaiming baptism of water for the forgiveness of sins. So many people went to John the Baptist and baptized them. 
even to Jesus. He had given baptism. Second, he emphasized that this baptism with water was not enough and complete, and that people needed to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, who was to come. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. John had baptized people for repentance, but he pointed to Jesus Christ, saying that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit through him. In other words, it was not just about repentance of sins, but it involved the process of being born again through Jesus Christ. The most important thing for you to become is God's children through the acceptance prayer for the repentance of sin and the acceptance of Jesus Christ. So for non-believers, I have given preaching of the gospel, and if I tell them that they are sinners, they don't want to hear it. I say, all people are sinners, and they would say, I'm not a sinner, I never stole anything, and I'm not a sinner because I've always lived by my consciousness, and I would think, are they crazy? Because in the Bible, it says that all people are sinners. Of course, you can say, I never conned, I never stole. But that is not sin. But there is that original sin. Even for an infant, they suck on the mother's breast. And they bite it, or even upon kicking the mother's stomach upon when they were in the womb. Therefore, if you look closely at the acceptance prayer, the key is to confess that you are a sinner and to pray for Jesus Christ to be the master of my life. John the Baptist proclaimed exactly this fact to the people of Israel as a witness of the gospel. At this time, it is an age where we are insensitive to sin. People feel rejected when they say sin on the pulpit. There are some believers in specific areas where they would not be able to open their houses to do church visitations. To this extent, it has changed where people reject because if they enter the homes, everything is revealed. Some people, they don't come to church because they say that it is burdensome. However, the Bible says that we must confront this sin first. This is where the change begins. If you don't repent, if you don't say I'm a sinner, you cannot receive salvation. And then you'll be able to accept Jesus and be forgiven for your sins. So when I evangelize, in the past I went to prison. And before, it said name, age, and why they were in prison. But for 70% of them, they come back and forth. And if I say, you are sinners, they say, it is correct. So when I was in Busan, I went to the five prisons. And we were in groups, and we went every Saturday. And one day I went to Hyundai police station, and 100% of them accepted, saying, I'm a sinner, I accept Jesus Christ. I gave out the acceptance cards and they wrote their names and filled it out. Usually it's 70, 80%, but at that time it was 100% and I was so touched I cannot forget about it. 
One important thing, however, is that many Christians still live in the sense of condemnation despite being children of God. The more they believe in Jesus Christ, well, it's like that. Even regarding my mother, she did not have time to commit sin, and she's not a person to commit sin. She always went to your early morning prayer service and had family service. But she always questioned, will I be able to go to heaven because I have so much sin? She was within the sense of condemnation. Jesus Christ's cru crucifixion is perfect. He finished all things to tell us tie. It is finished. It is completely over. Amen? That is why Apostle Paul proudly declares in Romans 8, 1, 2, So there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus, because the law of the Holy Spirit of life in Christ, Jesus had freed you from the law of sin and death. Amen? It is being free. What is the original sin? It is not believing in God. That is the greatest sin. believing in Jesus, how can you not commit sin? Because even if you open your eyes, even if you glare at someone, even if you just think about it, it is sin. Don't glare. Oh, that person. That is sin. Oh, I hate that person. That is murder. Do you understand? Looking at a female and saying, oh, that person is so sexy. That's committing adultery. I had a friend. And there, he went on the elevator, and she was really pretty. And then she was wearing revealing clothes, and he, she was so pretty that he saw her three times. So he prayed all night the prayer of repentance. So how can we live the life as a witness of? Jesus as a sinner. All we have to do is repent and it will be free. It would be forgiven. It should not always be you crying that you're a sinner. If you are in that state, you cannot do anything. Always saying, Sorry to the father. Oh God, can or oh father, can you please forgive me? If the father keeps on hearing that, it would be annoying. When you enjoy the true freedom, true joy, true peace, true appreciation, and true happiness given by Christ, when you enjoy that, you will be able to stand as the witness of the true gospel. Jesus Christ, you saved a wretch like me. But I believe in Jesus and receive salvation. That is a form of an evangelist. That is the gospel. For non believers, they would say, Oh, he's so thick faced. It's so embarrassing. Even so, you must be bold. The old has passed and the new has come. All believers of V1 Church, may you enjoy the wonderful blessings hidden in the gospel and be blessed by the name of the Lord, being witnesses of the gospel who sets up the absolute partisan of Christ in the field. This is the conclusion. There is a term called leadership virus. It is also the title of a management book. It is said that management consultants found the top managers were infected with the leadership virus while consulting in the corporate field. Leadership virus refers to a state of strength in the neck. The leadership virus turns the authority to save the organization into one's own power and the vision into personal ambition. If you look at the state of previous administrations in Korea, you can see that the end is not consistently good due to the people who have this leadership virus. 
and the end is not good. The same goes for our spiritual lives. The deeper we realize the gospel, the more we focus on the spiritual essence. The spiritual essence. Why did I become an elder? Why did I become a church officer? Why did I become a senior deaconess? John the Baptist faithfully carried out the mission to prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ. He focused and went all in into revealing only Christ without revealing himself. He said that he is low, not even being able to tie his shoelaces. This shows that we must live a life as a witness during such time of preaching for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Being humble for normal people. He would be saying, oh, I'm to this extent, and be proud, but only revealing Christ. St. John the Baptist went all in in revealing Christ. In the name of the Lord, starting from today, may all members of the One Church enjoy the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 24 hours through the word of the gospel of Mark and enter into the life of making works of eternity evangelization and missions and the mission's masterpiece. May be able to live this life of all in. Let us pray. Dear Father God, upon all believers of Yohan Church, upon starting Mark's upper room, like John the Baptist, unendingly, daily, anew within the gospel, may they go into it. And for the gospel, may they be able to enjoy the gospel, living the life as a witness of Christ in their workplace, in their families, in their fields, where their heart, their purpose and life and mission would be to proclaim Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.